Hey everyone, my name is Shashan Kalanithi, and today we're going to be going over the book Storytelling with Data, specifically Chapter 1. Storytelling with Data is a book I recommend to almost anyone who is in the data space, whether you're in analytics and data science, or even if you're a business professional who uses and works with data regularly. And the reason I say that is because at the end of the day, even through all of our analyses, you know, whether you use machine learning, statistics, Excel, doesn't matter, the purpose of examining and analyzing data is to present it, and in the, the most effective way to present it is in the form of a story. And that's what this book helps you master doing. Specifically, this book will help you structure out your presentation such that you have a compelling story to tell your stakeholders and to tell people you're presenting to. And it will help you pick the right graphs and charts in order to visualize data in a way that most effectively communicates your point. You don't have to be a data professional to be uh, to watch this video or to watch this course I'm doing right now. And this is useful for anyone who presents any kind of data. So going through chapter one, we're going to be going over these concepts over here. So you can see them, you know, one till the end of the different things we'll be covering in chapter one. And then I'll have a chapter two video out relatively soon. Before we get started, I wanted to thank this week's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning platform that helps you pick up, well, skills. They have all kinds of courses that are especially helpful for people that want to get into a creative profession such as making YouTube videos. I especially like this course by Justin Bridges on DSLR photography. I have this nice Sony A6100 and it is, uh, I mean, it's super cool. I've only done iPhone photography for the, for the most part, but I'm really excited about trying to use this camera. It's a mirrorless camera to try and take better photos and to learn how to take better videos so that I can give you guys a more clean presentation with my videos. And Skillshare has been awesome for giving me a series of courses courses in order to not only improve my YouTube videos, but to improve my photography, which will improve my YouTube videos. The first 1,000 people to use the link in the description box or the code Shashan Kalanithi, shown right over here, will get a free month of Skillshare. Support your favorite creators by supporting the people who support us uh, in the form of our sponsors. Be sure to try out Skillshare, code Shashan Kalanithi for a free one month trial. All right, so let's get started. So the first thing we're going to be going over is explanatory versus exploratory analysis. So let me paint a picture for you. You've been uh, assigned an analytical task. You're asked to do something with sales. You're trying to see why sales are down. And you spend maybe two weeks doing this task. You go through all kinds of data and you're putting together your presentation. Now you have an idea of exactly what the problem is and you have your hypothesis, you've tested it and you know what you want to present. So you go ahead and you start putting together all of your analyses and you want to present it to your stakeholder. Now, what do you do? Do you show them everything that you've done? Do you show them all the work that you've done? It's really tempting. At the end of the day, you've spent a lot of time putting together all of this data, but that's not a great way to present your data. That is what is called an exploratory analysis. And what you really want to be doing is presenting an explanatory analysis. So what is the difference between an exploratory and an explanatory analysis? Well, an exploratory analysis searches a wide array of factors looking for insight. So basically, when you were trying to figure out why exactly sales were down, you were performing an exploratory analysis. Whereas an explanatory analysis is analyzing and explaining a very specific thing, usually giving one to three insights. A personal example. So I am a data analyst and I work at a large North American company, a Fortune 500 company. And what we are sometimes asked to analyze why certain things happen, right? And it might take me, you know, two weeks and maybe a couple hundred lines of code uh, along with a lot of SQL queries in order to gather all the data, clean it up, run some statistics on it and say, okay, this is what I believe the cause of whatever phenomena we're trying to explain is. It would be really tempting for me to show my code to my stakeholders. And depending on the stakeholder, it might make sense to do that. But what you really want to be doing and what I found is most effective is to run the presentation down. It's to pare it down to what is necessary for that stakeholder to know. So of all the analyses I do, maybe there's 50 things that I found out. There's probably only one to three things that are relevant for any given stakeholder. I know it's tempting, but resist the urge to show your exploratory analysis. Now, there may be people in which this might be appropriate to give the exploratory analysis to. Usually your boss or maybe someone who's checking out your work prior to you presenting it to a higher up, but really resist this urge as it will derail the focus of your presentation. All right, so now that you've done your exploratory analysis and you know you only want to communicate a couple of insights in the form of an explanatory analysis, the next thing we need to focus on is the who, the what, and the how. Let's start off with the who. When we're talking about the who, there are two who's that you need to focus on. Who is in your audience and who are you in relation to them? What is your relationship to them? 
When determining who is in your audience, I like to look at this diagram that I made over here. So this diagram is not in the book. This is something that I made where this is where I think you should be able to place everyone that you will be presenting to as part of your audience. There are two axes, hierarchy versus technical familiarity. You are the origin and technical familiarity further to the right means that the person is more familiar with the technicals of what you're talking about. Business familiarity could also be a synonym for what we're talking about. And then up and down talks about hierarchy. You are at the origin. And it's important that you understand where on this chart everyone that you're pre presenting to is relative to you. If someone is higher up on the technical familiarity, you'll want to go more in depth in your presentation because they probably will have some very detailed questions that they want to ask you. And this is not necessarily related to hierarchy. For example, I've had directors who are very technically familiar and directors who are not so technically familiar. So it's not necessarily related to hierarchy. This usually has more to do with the person themselves, uh, how in the weeds do they tend to get and slash or what type of field you're in. In some fields, you can only become a director if you are very technically familiar with the concepts being spoken about. Next, you want to focus on a hierarchy. Where are you relative to the people you're speaking to? And this will drastically change how you communicate. So technical familiar familiarity will usually change what you communicate and hierarchy will usually change how you communicate. I find that the higher up you go in hierarchy, you need to be able to distill what you're doing down to a couple of insights, but be prepared to answer very detailed questions. For example, when you're talking to an executive versus talking to your manager, you will usually want to talk to the executive in much higher terms, but very discerning uh, executives will also know how to ask very probing questions. So uh, talking at a high level does not mean not being prepared. On the other hand, if you're talking to your manager, your manager, depending on if they're a working manager or uh, not an IC manager, they may actually want to see um, a significantly more detailed presentation from you where you talk about all the little minutia of what you did. Usually, they'll want to see this to make sure as your analysis gets passed up the chain that you have considered all of the eventualities and all of the little things you need to consider when you are pulling your data and analyzing your data. So that was the who. Let's focus on the what right now. The what refers to what exactly do you want to communicate? And this sounds super obvious, but you would be surprised how many times I've gotten into a presentation not knowing exactly what I want to communicate. What you want to communicate is not a, it's, it's not your analysis. The what you want to communicate is a very specific insight or set of insights that can be written down and very clearly explained to people, AKA, what action or insight do you want the audience to take away? A way to ensure that you can actually communicate what these are is to have a three-minute story and the big idea. The three-minute story is exactly what it sounds like. It's basically a three-minute presentation where if, if you only had three minutes to explain what you were doing, how would you explain this? Now, this is great to first center your presentation on why it's important at all, but it's also great anecdotally, I found, because it can be very helpful in trying to make better relationships with higher ups at your company. To give you guys an example, when I was working at a company prior to COVID, when we were all in the office, I would always make sure to have a quick like blurb in my head of any work that I was doing. And the reason I did this is because I found out occasionally executives would just walk around the office and they may just be like, hey, what's up? Or they're in the kitchen and there's an opportunity to talk to them. And in those instances, I feel like it's very important to have a quick three minute, I would even say 90 second, quite honestly, but three minute story about what you're working on and how it's important to the business. That way executives are, uh, when they think about you, they're like, oh yeah, this person is important to the company because they do X, Y, Z. Like there's a very clear line in their head of what you do and the importance it has to, uh, to, in the company. So how do you make a three minute story? Well, it's very similar to the star method of interviewing. I believe that there are four steps to it. You want to set the scene or the problem. You want to then step two, declare what your hypothesis is. Then you want to step three, experiment slash, uh, show your experiment slash analysis. And then finally step four, show your results. The example that they gave in the book is highlighted over here and I've color coded it for each of the four steps that I believe are necessary in order to have a good three minute story. Now let's try with an example that you can do. Okay, so it's your turn now. So here's the situation. You work at Schmoogle. Now, Schmoogle is a very large corporation that owns the Mandroid mobile operating system, one of the most popular mobile operating systems on the planet. Currently, any transactions that take place on the Mandroid app store, you take a 30% cut of. 
Now, the hypothesis is you've done some analyses and you've shown that reducing that cut, the cut, the 30% cut to say 15% in exchange for letting app developers use their own payment processors will actually increase revenue. Create your three minute story, comment it in the comment section below, and I will tell you what I think about it. Awesome. Now that was the three minute story. Now you want the big idea. The big idea is literally a sentence that explains what your analysis is and why it's important. And there are three main points that you want to make sure you hit when you're talking about the big idea. Number one, it must be, it must articulate your unique point of view. This is very important because if you don't have a unique point of view, what is the point of what you are saying? Why should anyone listen to you? Number two, it must convey what's at stake. Again, what is the point of what you're saying? Why should anyone listen to you? And then three, it must be a complete sentence. And the reason that this is really, really important is because you need something that sticks in people's heads. At the end of the day, the whole point of storytelling with data is to ensure that what you say and what you do is not wasted analyses and that it actually sticks in people's heads. I can't tell you the number of times I've done an analysis and people completely forget about it. And that's because I didn't structure my analysis and, or let me rephrase that. I didn't structure the presentation of my analysis in such a way that forced people to care. So practice again. Take that schmoogle example I gave you earlier and try and create a big idea. Comment it in the comment section below and let's see what you guys got. The third thing we need to worry about after the who and the what is the how. And the how is really just what data will you use and what graphs will you use to communi communicate your point. We'll be going over that in chapter two. One secret tip that the book gives you, and this is the last concept in chapter one, is the idea of storyboarding. Now, storyboarding is basically taking the major highlights of what you're going to present and putting them on separate, uh, usually things like uh, post-it notes or something, and then organizing them in a way that makes sense. The first idea you think about for organizing your um, presentation may not make the most sense and may not be the best way to go forward. So use post-it notes instead of presentation software in order to exp in order to organize your presentation from start to finish and then create your presentation in presentation software. The reason you want to use post-it notes is you want something disposable, easily disposable. That way you don't gain any attachment to what you're working on. It's very tempting to go straight for the PowerPoint, but as we create our PowerPoints, we get very attached to what we create and it makes it harder for us to dump parts of the presentation that may not be necessary and might be less effective. Remember, explanatory analysis, not exploratory analysis. Resist the urge, and I mean it, resist the urge to dump everything you did onto the stakeholders. It will just make your presentation less impressive. All right, and that's chapter one. Chapter two will be coming out soon. Let me know if you guys like this style of video, what you would like to see to improve the style of video. Hopefully the visuals were help very helpful as well. And uh, be sure to check out the sponsor in the link in the description below, and it's probably gonna be in the pinned comment as well. This is Shashan Kalanithi, signing off.